I've made a video game which we're going to pick apart for interesting points of game design in the hopes that we might all learn something. Now, don't expect to be as great at my game as I am, because we can't all be as perfect and attractive as me. Oh, what the f- Running Red is in a subgenre of the 2D platformer known as an auto runner. This style is particularly popular on mobile platforms because it lends itself well to the single button control that you get with a touchscreen. Popular examples include Cannibalt, Alto's Odyssey, Jetpack Joyride, and Flappy Bird. I made this game over a couple of days to sort of dust off the cobwebs since it's been a long time since I put any serious effort into game development and I wanted to remove the rust on my skills. It's also a great opportunity to talk about some basic elements of game design philosophy, covering some of what you might broadly call the fundamentals. What we're going to be talking about are the decisions and considerations I made while making the game, to demonstrate the complexity and depth of mechanics that you can aim for, even in something as simple as a one-button platformer. Now, this doesn't cover everything, and the game's certainly not perfect, but hopefully what we're about to discuss will be useful, interesting, or at least entertaining. The first fundamental is one that you'll be hearing a lot on this channel, and on most channels related to game design. The primary gameplay loop. This is about to get very complicated. The primary gameplay loop is... the thing that you do. That's it, and that's what it is. If you do it, primarily as part of the game, then that's the primary gameplay loop. For example, in Super Mario Bros. you run to the right and jump. That's what you do, and that's the primary gameplay loop. Because Super Mario Bros. is a well-designed video game, Everything else in the game is related to your ability to move to the right and jump. All of the enemies are moving to the left to get in your way, and you jump on them. Some enemies are designed so that you can't jump on them. There are platforms at various heights to either help or hinder your ability to go to the right and jump on them. Coins and blocks are placed so that you'll move and jump on them. You get the idea. In my opinion, if you're designing a video game, your absolute first consideration should be the primary gameplay loop unless you're EA, and then your first consideration is how you're going to make money from it. The reason for this is that the primary gameplay loop is the base on which you build everything else, no matter what genre you're working in. It affects the level design, the aesthetics, the controls, other mechanics, and it even spreads out into something like marketing. Because if you're going to try and tell people about your game, what are you going to tell them? I made a game that looks pretty, but I don't know what you do in it. That only works if you're trying to make an esoteric walking simulator and win some awards. The primary loop in Running Red is... Actually, let's pause. You pop down to the comments below the video and you tell me what you think the primary gameplay loop is in a game called Running Red. I'll wait here. Are you done? If you said running, you're wrong. Well, all right, you're not, but there is also jumping. You don't actually do the running, the game does that for you. So what you have to focus on, and therefore what I had to focus on as a designer, was the jumping. This meant I spent an inordinate amount of time tweaking the jump physics. Things like gravity, velocity, choosing between a variable or consistent height, making the decision to let the player just jump infinitely in mid-air, like Flappy Bird. This was important because once I'd settled on this first seemingly simple choice, I would base literally everything else on it. The enemies and the speed and frequency in which they spawn, the height of pickups and the power-ups, the speed of the scrolling, the variance of the player animation. Everything comes from this decision. In fact, I feel confident saying there isn't a single decision in the game that isn't somehow affected by or related to the primary gameplay loop. If you're currently developing a video game, first of all, thank you for watching my video. It's nice to have you. Hello. Secondly, please spend five minutes today just playtesting your primary loop and nothing else. Hide everything else in your project and just play around with the main mechanic for five minutes just to make sure. It won't really cost you anything, and if you arrive at a sudden epiphany that everything needs fixing, you've saved yourself a lot of heartbreak later on. The next of the fundamental basics that we're going to be talking about that I tried to give considerable thought to is... Information. Now I know what you're thinking, you just rambled on about jump physics for 19 years, how much more information could I possibly need? I'm not talking about that kind of information. If you look at this screen, what do you see? Our main character, who I've never given a name to, so I suppose we'll call him Red, is over here, on the left. On the right is all this wide, empty space, and the screen slowly starts to scroll. Immediately, the player knows where they're going. They also know that this is happening without them having to do anything, so they know that they're going to move forward automatically. By this point, they also know what the jump button is, but I haven't told them. Here on the title screen, you'll see the text, Press Jump and Nothing Else. It doesn't tell you what button jump is, for a very good reason. 
This is, at the moment, a PC game, so we can assume everybody playing it has a keyboard. A few days ago, I put out a tweet, follow me on Twitter, at ZaneDoesThings, asking what people would consider the jump button on a standard keyboard, not including space, the up arrow, enter, or shift. I got a varied response. One guy said numpad 8, and then I took the most reasonable responses and numpad 8 guy, and made it so that if you press one of those on the title screen, it becomes your jump button. By doing this, I haven't taught the player what jump is, they've taught themselves, and they've picked the control scheme that they're most comfortable comfortable with. Now I appreciate this isn't an approach you can take with anything more complicated than a one button platformer. You can't exactly open up a new game of Civilization 6 and wait until it asks you which button you'd like to press to build, or move, or nuke Gandhi. It'd get tedious and complicated. But what this demonstrates is the idea that you don't need to overload your player with information. You can, for example, give them information just when they need it. Because this is so specific to the kind of game you're making, I'm only really bringing this up in the hopes that you, if you are a developer, will take a moment to think about it after you've spent five minutes testing your primary gameplay loop. Sticking with information, what's this? If you've been watching the video and not just playing it in the background, which is also fine, by the way, you'll have seen this effect. Red hits this glowing thingy and turns into, effectively, a ghost. This is an invincibility power-up, but I haven't told the player that because they don't actually need to know. At the start of the game there's this huge space to let the player jump around and get used to the physical properties of the character's movement. Then a power-up appears at ground level which if they're not jumping around would be unavoidable. If they run into it, the effect will trigger and they'll see something has happened. They won't know what, but they'll also know they're not dead. Their score, which is in constant view above their character, will also jump up by a considerable number. This is enough to tell them, hey, this is good pick it up. After this, they'll never see a power-up at ground level again. This one is exclusively for their benefit, the rest have to be earned. I did this because I'm sort of breaking an established rule of human psychology. Colour theory. It's generally accepted that green is a good colour. It means yes, go, good, success, guacamole. Red, on the other hand, is its complementary colour and therefore its opposite. It's usually a bad colour that means no, stop, bad, danger, do not eat the lava no matter how delicious it looks, like a forbidden chilli sauce. So for me to use red for my character and for the positive aspects of the game, I have to do a couple of things. First I make sure red and similar tones like hot pink are exclusively used for positive player interactions, i.e. the player character, the coins and the power-up, and I also give them room to discover this on their own. I then make sure there's positive feedback when the player interacts with a red thing. There's a little glowing after image for the coins accompanied by a series of rising plinky plonky sound effects. And like I said, it doesn't really matter if they don't understand what the power up is for, because the game still works even if they never pick one up. But it's likely that they will, because the game is so fast paced and quick to restart, hopefully when they die they'll have a few more tries and statistically at some point they'll hit the power up, run through an enemy, notice they're not dead, and figure it out for themselves. The points I'm making here are that you should try and reinforce your lessons to the player in a way that will come naturally in the gameplay, and anything the player discovers on their own without banging their head against the wall in frustration is more satisfying than something you've had to tell them about. Player discovery and exploration is deeply rewarding no matter what genre you're in, so I made some consideration to how I could integrate that into something as simple as a one-button auto-runner. The last fundamental basic I want to touch on in this video is player bias. Did you know that video games aren't as hard as you think they are? If you're a developer, you may have heard this before, but if you're not, let me explain. When you get hit by an enemy, it's because the game has done a calculation that you, like an idiot, ran right into an enemy's face and that enemy killed you. Right? Well, no. What actually collided with the enemy is this, a collision box. This is an invisible asset that follows along with you and your movement, but is crucially significantly smaller than you are. If we tried to do it on an absolute pixel-to-pixel -pixel collision system, it'd be a nightmare. This is a screen of resolution 1280 by 720 or 720p. I'm going to add a pixel. There it is. It's hardly visible. In fact, depending on what quality you're watching this video in, it might not be visible at all. If we used that pixel, let's say the one at the top right corner of Red's head, the player would need to have faster reflexes than the computer that's running the game. They'd need to account for every single pixel of their character sprite at all times, and frankly, people aren't that good. Exact pixel collision detection would only be fair if you had the reaction times of a computer processor, which you don't, because compared to a computer, you're an idiot. Everybody has an inherent delay in their reaction times, even ninjas. This practice is common in pretty much every good video game with combat in it. There's always an element of player bias where the odds are secretly stacked in your favour. Another example is the invincibility power-up I was talking about earlier. I use a couple of techniques to let the player know when it's about to run out. There's a sound effect that stops well short of the end. 
a blurred out ghost image that I think looks quite cool, and a red glow around the edges of the screen. Incidentally, in normal games this would usually signify that you're getting hurt and you're low on health. Good thing I went to great lengths to codify that red is actually good now, isn't it? All of these effects go away before the invincibility wears off, so that the player has fair warning that they're not invincible anymore. But we don't stop there. Oh no, because after the visual effect of the invincibility has gone, and it looks like we're back to normal, there's then a further 10 frames, or about a sixth of a second, where the player is secretly still invincible. The upshot of this is that if anyone leaves a comment saying, hey I thought I was invincible and I died 0 out of 10 worst game ever, I know they're actually just bad, because I've allowed for that. Player bias is important in every genre because it means that when a player fails, they really fail and they can't blame you for it. It also means that they have the best possible chance of having fun, and really, isn't that the most important thing? If it's not fun, why bother? There's still a lot I haven't talked about, like how the music I chose grows in intensity and instruments used as the level goes on to give the player a sense of progress and achievement, but I think I've rambled long enough. So let's move to the conclusion. Running Red is obviously very simple. It was an easy project for me to put together, and because I've done it, I feel confident that I can go on to something slightly more complex. It doesn't feature many mechanics, so there's not a lot we can learn from it, but hopefully you found what we did look at to be helpful, interesting, or entertaining. When I finish a project, I like to think about what I might do if I was taking it even further forward. The first thing would be fixing this awkward broken level transition in the graphics. Then I think I'd probably look to make an Android port. I'd most likely implement that money-making thing where you can watch a 30 second advert for another life in the run you're on. I'd also probably try and diversify the graphics, so that the backgrounds and visual design could match the rising music tone to give a better sense of progress. I don't know if Running Red will ever get any further than this, but if it never does, it's still been a worthwhile and, I think, positive quality experience. Above everything else, I've finished and released a game, and I can't overstate how important it is to actually finish something. If you want to play Running Red, there's a link in the description to the game's itch.io page, as well as links to the open source graphics packs and royalty-free music I use to make it. I officially hereby challenge you to beat my high score, and if you do, tweet me a screenshot of it and I'll yell at you over the internet for clearly cheating. If you found the video enjoyable or useful or interesting, then please leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't, and also consider subscribing, because I plan to make many more videos in this style going forward about games that weren't made by me. So make sure you turn notifications on, or else you might miss it. And I wouldn't want that for you because I care about your emotional well-being. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you the next time I feel like saying, hey, let's talk game design. <laughs>